Thank you for joining today's webinar on the anatomy of a recession, what to look for and where we're headed. My name is Hank Kim, and I'm the executive director of the National Conference on Public Employee Retirement Systems. Today's program is part of our expanded Center for Online Learning, which provides remote continuing education to public pension trustees, staff, and other fiduciaries and stakeholders. Like many on this webinar and around the world, we are all adjusting to, new, or to the new normal of stay-at-home orders. As such, we're using our residential ISPs and asking more of our online platforms. So please bear with us if there should be any technical issues or an errant back, background noise should interrupt our program. As always, your, pre, your patience and understanding is appreciated. The corona, uh, coronavirus outbreak has sparked historic market volatility and pushed the US into a recession, if not a depression. Can aggressive monetary and fiscal stimulus stave off a long downturn? What factors are most important to watch in the months ahead? In today's webinar, Jeffrey Schultze with ClearBridge Investments will answer these and other pressing questions. Jeff is an investment strategist and oversees capital market and economic research at ClearBridge. He joined ClearBridge Investments in 2014 and has 14 years of investment industry experience. We do encourage audience participation. Please submit your questions by using the GoToWebinar portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics today, we will hold your questions till the last part of the program. Jeffrey, at this time, I'll turn over the webinar to you. Great, Hank. Thank you so much. And good morning or good afternoon to everybody on the call. Thank you so much for, for joining here. Uh, my name is Jeff Schulze. I'm the investment strategist for ClearBridge. And what that really means is I'm responsible for coming up with the firm's macro and market outlook, not only here for the U.S., but for the international space as well. And one of the first things that I did when I stepped into this role back in 2016 was create the program that you're going to see today, the anatomy of a recession, what to look for and where we're headed. And it's a program that changes along with the time. So this isn't going to be evergreen. As the markets change, as the economy changes, now we're in a recession, the, the, the content that you're gonna to hear to is going to change along with it. And it's a really impactful program. And, and we started a distribution list for this uh, program a little under two years ago. And in that time frame, we've gone from zero to over 20,000 subscribers. Um, and what they get when they get in the subscription list, they get a monthly update on where we are with the economic dashboard that you're going to see. And then on a quarterly basis, you're gonna get an updated slide deck, again, going through new content and our views for what we see happening from that point forward. So if you're interested in what you hear today, I encourage you to go to legmason.com. Um, that's our parent company, it's L-E-G-G-M-A-S-O-N, legmason.com forward slash AOR. Um, so with that and that shameless plug, I uh, just wanted to get into the content here. And, and again, I really do want some participation. I love Q&A. So probably about 35 minutes of prepared comments, and then we'll open it up to the floor and, and see and hopefully address any of the concerns that you have. And the reason why we came out with this program is really the first slide that we're, we're looking at right here. This idea that recessions typically cluster with market crashes. Now, I know everybody here probably knows what a recession is commonly believe that a recession is the drop of GDP for two consecutive quarters, but what exactly is a market crash, right? There really isn't a textbook definition for the term. Well, at the start, we can define a bear market. A bear market is the decline of the S&P 500 of 20% or more. But that begs the question, is every bear market a market crash? And we make the argument that if it lasts less than a year, probably not. And a great example of this was back in 2018. So if you remember the fourth quarter of 2018, it was a pretty scary market environment. The market dropped almost 20% in three short months. But if the investor just stayed the course, stayed invested until the second quarter of 19, so you know four months later, the markets were reaching new highs and they never really looked back. So in order to be called a market crash or to be worthy of that designation, I think you need to see some persistence to that downturn. So let's define a market crash as a bear market that lasts longer than a year. And by that definition, you can see on the top left-hand side of the, of the slide here, we've had six market crashes going back to 1960. Five out of six of those, which are the shaded bars, they clustered with a recession. 
Now, just to hammer home this point, how important it is to find these market crashes and recessions, we went out and looked at every other large drawdown that we saw over that same 60-year period that may not have fit the technical definition of a market crash. And we put them on the top right-hand corner of this, this slide here, and we've labeled those as pullbacks. When you, when you compare the crashes versus the pullbacks, we come across three important conclusions. The first is at the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, is that your average crash lasts 3.7 times longer than your average pullback. Your average crash usually lasts a little bit over a year and a half versus your average pullback at less than half a year. Secondly, right in the middle, your average crash sees a drawdown that's 2.3 times more severe. So the S&P 500 loses 42% in a crash versus 18% in a pullback. And then lastly, most importantly, on the right-hand side, that the average crash is 2.9 times more likely to cluster with recessions. So this is a key feature, a key theme that we put this presentation together is that recessions and market crashes, they cluster with one another. And unfortunately, we're, we're already in a recession. And we've been warning our, our readers and the AOR community that there was higher recession risks in the economy coming into 2020. And it's a stoplight analogy, meaning green is expansion, yellow is caution, and then red is a recession. Um, and if you look here, um, you can see coming into the year in January of 2020, we had a lot of yellow and green, but a couple red, but the overall signal was yellow. Then when we got to March 15th, um, we had signaled to the AOR community that we fully anticipated a recession, but due to the nature of this situation, we needed the data to catch up to the dashboard. Um, so we had foreshadowed that we were going to go red, but we couldn't do it quite yet. Um, and then, of course, at the end of March, as some of the worst economic data started to come in, we are now a recessionary red. So what had changed between March 15th and March 31st? Well, we saw the commodities indicator go from green to red. Obviously, with a lot of countries going on lockdown, there's a lot more weakness in commodity pricing. And uh, we look at a broad-based measure of commodities. We look at copper, steel, lumber, uh, oil. Um, and, and usually, when these are going down, that's a bad sign that global growth is starting to weaken. So we've seen weakening of global growth, we've seen weakness in pricing, and obviously it's a red signal as we speak. We've also seen ISM new orders go from yellow to red. Now, if you're not familiar with manufacturing PMI, which is what ISM new orders is from, all it is is a survey that's given to manufacturers asking them how business conditions are, but also how business conditions look to be in the future. And the new orders component is the most forward-looking component of that survey. Um, new orders fell down to a 42 level. Um, just as a reminder, anything uh, 50 is pretty much the line of demarcation that doesn't indicate expansion or contraction. So if you're over 50, it's expansion. If you're under 50, it's contraction. And 42 is a pretty bad print. And of course, the most notable change that we saw on the dashboard was jobless claims. It went from green to red. And to put it in perspective, coming into the beginning of March, jobless claims were running at around 210,000. The last three months, weeks alone of jobless claims, we've seen 17 million claims. And unfortunately, claims are going to continue to get worse in April. We're anticipating another 10 to 15 million job losses in the, in the coming months. So unfortunately, jobless claims are going to continue to pile up. But because of all of these changes, the dashboard has turned red, and we are, we believe, officially in a recession. Now, here's the proof statement of the dashboard. And, and I, I left this in here for a very specific reason, is that this is the dashboard's output heading into the last seven recessions. Um, you can see that we are red six out of seven of those time frames. We're yellow one out of the time frames. And the, the period that we were yellow, I think actually bears the most resemblance to where we are today. So we've never really had a global pandemic per se that's caused a recession. But I believe that this was really a supply shock that morphed into a demand shock. And it was a similar situation to what we saw back in the early 1970s. So in 1973, you had the oil embargo. Um, and the oil prices went up by 400% over the course of nine months, very short period of time. Uh, and because of that supply shock to oil, that caused the demand shock to consumers because consumers spent a lot more money on oil back then than they do today. And then when you didn't have that, that extra money because you're spending it at the pump, everybody stopped spending. And we had a pretty nasty recession. You think about where we are today. This started off as a supply shock when China went offline to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. And it morphed into a demand shock when the virus ultimately hit our shores and all of these lockdowns started to go into place. So similar to that period, it was yellow the month that the recession started. And I believe that when we look back, and this is officially called the recession, the yellow signal would have been March. 
but we were red the month following that recession as the economic data caught up. And it was a similar situation to what we saw in the early 1970s. Now, one of the reasons why we're cautious and quite frankly, one of the reasons why I think that this is going to be a recession that is going to linger more than what people anticipate at the given moment is because profit margins are under pressure. Now, importantly, we don't look at S&P 500 profit margins for the dashboard. We, if you look at S&P 500 companies, usually you'll see margin deterioration there last because they're the best companies in the world. They have a lot of levers that they can pull in order to maintain those margins. What we look at is a much broader view of margins. It's called NIPA profit margin. That looks at micro, small, mid, large, and mega cap companies. It's a much better barometer of what's going on in the U.S. economy. If you look at the top right-hand corner, uh, that first that slide up there, you can see that red dotted line is where we thought NIPA profit margins were coming into 2019, but there was a huge revision down in July of last year of $200 billion. That's a huge revision outside of a recession. And you can see that blue line underneath there is where profit margins for the U.S. economy has been. And it's been roughly flat for over four years, since 2015. Now, importantly, this is disproportionately hurt your micro and small cap companies because of a higher compensation cost and the inability to pass these tariffs through to their customers. And if you look at the pie chart on the top left-hand side of the slide, you can see that over 59% of U.S. workers work for a company that has less than 1,000 employees. Your average Russell 2000 company, which most of us think of as a small cap, employs closer to 3,700 people. So your average Russell 2000 company is four times the size of where most Americans work. So part of the reason why we were cautious coming into this time frame and we had been advocating to our clients to upgrade in quality and, and know what you own is because when profit margins come under pressure, when you can't, can't, you can't bring margins back in, companies will start to cut back labor. And you started to see hours being cut back in the manufacturing sector. And if that doesn't do the trick, it ultimately leads to layoffs. And layoffs, of course, are the last domino to fall as you go into a recession. So this is one of the reasons why we were cautious, but more importantly, I think it's one of the reasons why this is going to be exacerbated and we're gonna see a lot more jobless claims than what we would have seen if we were in a healthier part of the economic cycle. So what we're looking at here is job openings. And job openings, it's a great series. The reason why it's not in the dashboard is because it doesn't have a long enough history. Most of the data that we have in the dashboard has over 50, you know, sometimes even 100 years worth of data. Java openings only came out in the early 2000s, but it is a very good lead indicator on what's likely to happen in the labor market. Now, what we're looking at here is the change in jobless claim, uh, job openings, I'm, for, I'm sorry, job openings over the last year. And you can see that it's been dropping really since early 2019, and it went below that zero level, which is usually a sign that a recession is at hand. So, Things weren't good with the U.S. economy as we hit the COVID-19 crisis, but unfortunately, even though you're going to see a lot of layoffs in industries that are affected, like hospitality and leisure and retail, this is also going to affect other industries that we're just seeing some margin pressure. And this is a key reason why I think the unemployment rate here in the U.S. could get to the high teens, maybe even the low 20 percent range when all is said and done. But again, because of this dynamic, I do think that this is gonna be much more of an overhang on the economy when we come out the other side of this storm. This was a slide that uh, quite frankly, we had gotten in a lot of slack for um, because uh, we were saying we caution was warranted because the last number of times that the Fed had cut three rates, the markets are usually going to shear that instance. So you can see that the Fed cut rates three times in 96 and 98, which are your two soft landing scenarios at the top. And they also cut three times in 01 and 07, which are your two recessionary scenarios at the bottom. Importantly, three months after that rate cut, you can see that the markets are generally positive. Um, so again, they always think that the Fed has saved the day, but it's really only six months after that third rate cut where you truly understand whether or not you're in a recession or a soft landing. The markets were in a soft landing when the six months after that third rate cut, the markets were positive. Obviously in the two recessions, they were substantially negative. And six months after the third rate cut this time around is going to be April 30th. And I think, again, it's going to be a negative reading, signifying that we were in a recession. But nonetheless, the dashboard was felt that the U.S. economy was in a vulnerable position. You know, we, we felt that there could be a catalyst that pushed us into a recession. And by no means did we think that a global pandemic and the COVID-19 virus was going to be that catalyst. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, I think this is going to exacerbate the weakness that we're going to see 
and labor markets. And it's going to take us a little bit longer to dig out of this hole, again, if we were at a different part of the economic cycle. Now, let's talk about how we got here. And, and uh, the first, uh, this is a very interesting slide. And this is a current, this is an adage that you hear when you talk about financial markets all the time, is that markets take the stairs up and the elevator down, meaning it takes a long time to climb to a peak, but it doesn't take a long time for that peak to uh, go down to the ultimate trough and the sell-off to commence. So this is every 15% plus sell-off that we've seen uh, since 1957. Um, you can see the median time to climb to the peak uh, and each of those sell-offs was 16 months. And then the, the time that it took to go from peak to trough, that sell-off only took six months. So it was about a year and a half to climb to the peak, a half a year to fall to the bottom. More importantly though, once you hit that bottom, the markets will usually slingshot back up and, uh, and it takes about seven months to get back to that previous high. So again, uh, the markets are doing that right now. You've seen a pretty swift sell-off and you've seen the markets rebound back up. But I think this is a very unique sell-off of what we've seen and it's nothing that we've seen in history. So this is the fastest bear market that we've seen from a peak um, in the history of the S&P 500. It took us 22 trading days to reach bear market territory. Now, put that in perspective, that's twice as fast as the second fastest ever in U.S. history, and that happened to be in September of 1929 as the U.S. economy was heading into the Great Depression. Now, there's a key reason why this happened. Now, most of participants were anticipating a soft landing. Um, so they had felt that earnings growth was going to reaccelerate and up to 10% here in 2020, and they had fully priced that into the market, but when it became clear that the virus was going to come to the U.S. and you're likely going to have shutdowns and potentially recession, a very big re-rating had to happen. And that was the initial sell-off that you saw. But importantly, because it was such an aggressive sell-off, that, that, that morphed into more of a liquidity crisis, which was much more damaging because many systematic investors were not prepared for this. And they were crippled because they had rising correlations, which a lot of these strategies are built off of, and leverage. And that led to forced selling to stay within margin requirements, and that created a negative feedback loop that perpetuated itself. And because of that, March was the most volatile month in the market's history. The average move that you saw in the market in March was 4.95%, so almost 5% per day. The second most volatile month in history was, ironically, back in 1929, and that was closer to 4%. The key here, though, is that the Fed has stepped in. The Fed has gone through unprecedented measures in order to stabilize financial markets. I say that it's how do whatever it takes moment, which is similar to what Draghi uttered back in 2012 in order to save the Eurozone. They deployed their entire financial crisis playbook in two weeks, and then they borrowed pages out of the, the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan as well. They're now baby, they're buying assets in pretty much every credit market that's out there outside of high yield. And it's a key reason why you've seen markets stabilize. Um, so I think that liquidity crisis, which is why this was so scary from the beginning, that has been put under wraps and we're not going to see that type of volatility going forward. But more importantly, when you think about volatility, um, even though you see a peaking of volatility, it doesn't necessarily mean that you see the bottom of the market. You actually saw a peaking of volatility back in 2008, five months prior to the bottom of the markets in March of 09. And a key reason why you saw a peaking out of volatility is because the Fed and Congress stepped in to offer stimulus to the markets and take that tail risk out of consideration. It's a similar dynamic to what we find ourselves in today. Now, another reason, obviously, why the markets sold off so aggressively is because how uh, of a big uh, uh, disruptive recession this was going to be. And looking at it from a different perspective, we already talked about jobless claims and what our expectations are there, but this looks at hourly workers. And the hourly workers in March versus the same day in January of this year. As the, the shutdown started to commence, you can see that hourly worker employment by the end of March was down by 65% from just two months earlier. So again, this is a very deep and robust uh, recession that we're seeing. And it, it's hurting, again, a lot of the hourly workers the most. And this is key because the consumers came here in the U.S. Um, if the U.S. consumer was a standalone country, uh, it would be the most largest country in the world as a percent of the world GDP coming in at 16.5%. 70% uh, of our economy is consumer spending. Um, so if the U.S. consumer is either laid off or they're at home and they're not allowed to go out and spend, obviously it's going to have a very deep economic effect. And as we speak, 95% of the population 
is experiencing a lockdown at the given moment. So obviously, if people can't spend or they don't have a job to have money to spend, consumption is going to come down. So this looks at how long the lockdowns will occur and what's the potential loss to GDP. And we assume a pretty bad scenario. Let's just say the U.S. GDP loses 50% when the economy is fully shut down. For every week that this occurs, it shaves almost $500 billion off of U.S. GDP. This goes on for a month. It's probably $1.8 billion, a trillion, I should say. It goes to two months, it's $3.6 trillion. Now, the numbers are probably going to be in the 30% range, so 50 is maybe a little bit too aggressive of a, of a, a scenario. But again, this will show you what the impact to the U.S. economy will ultimately be. Now, the one thing that I'm concerned with is that it, since we had a staggered shutdown here in the U.S., it was more of a regional shutdown, um, not like what we had in China and Italy. When China went into lockdown, they locked down the entire country. When we had it here in the U.S., it was more piecemeal where it started on the coast, and now you're starting to see lockdowns on the interior. I think that if we try to get out to the other side of this storm, if we do have to wait um, because not all parts of the country went out of lockdown at the same time, um, that could keep the U.S. economy locked up longer than what people anticipate at the moment. It does appear that you're going to see regions of the country come out of lockdown at different times, but if you want to take a more conservative approach to make sure that the virus doesn't spread back to the coast or get reinfected back to the coast because they're the first to go under lockdown, again, this would be something would be a little bit more of a bearish scenario for the U.S. economy and ultimately markets as well. Now, let's look at how long recessions typically last. So looks at every recession since 1918. Um, there's been 18 of them. Um, you can see the average length of a recession is 13 months, so it's a little bit over a year. Um, the one that we highlighted all the way to the left, though, is uh, the, the last global pandemic that we saw, which uh, had, that recession happened amidst the Spanish flu. The key there is that it was one of the shortest recessions. It only lasted seven months altogether. Now, most economists are saying that this uh, this recession is only going to be a quarter long. I'm not so sure. I think when we get back to some sort of normalcy, I think that it's going to take a little bit of time for the U.S. economy to come back online. Um, so I think that this is going to be a little bit more of a lingering type of situation. So it wouldn't be a surprise to us if we see this recession last into Q3 may, and then maybe sometime in the later part of Q3 coming out the other side and formally exiting this recession. But one thing I want to highlight here is that stocks anticipate economic recoveries. You know, just like the stock market will start to roll over before a recession happens, stocks will anticipate the lows and they will start to move higher before the recession is over as well. Um, on average, you've seen the stock market bottom three months before the end of a recession. Uh, more importantly, though, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that the average peak to trough of the last 11 recessions, or the average drawdown that we've seen, has been 30%. The peak to trough decline that we've seen here has been closer to 35%. So we're actually at a much deeper drawdown than what the average recession would typically entail. And it has a lot of people questioning right now. Have we seen the bottom in the, in the market? or are we, have, are we going to retest the lows and ultimately make a new bottom? And it's a fair question. I know the markets are up almost 25% from the lows. Um, the last 13 trading days have been the best 13 trading days in a row in the history of markets. Um, so with just as ferocious of a sell-off as what we saw to hit those bottoms, you've had as ferocious of a rebound as well. Um, the one reason why we're kind of guarded on whether or not we've seen the low or not, and we, we may have seen the low, um, but we'll only know in hindsight, is that generally speaking, when you have recessionary bear markets, you have what we call counter trend rallies or dead cat bounces or suckers rallies. They're, they're called different names, but they're really just a very strong rebound after a sell-off. Um, and if you look on the left-hand side, you can see that we looked at the largest historical counter trend rallies in the last seven recessions, and they've gotten bigger over the years. Um, the two most pronounced were obviously 2001, and also 2008, the great financial crisis. In 2001, the biggest uh, counter trend rally that we saw during that time frame was 19%. But because you had a market that was so overvalued because of the dot-com bubble, the market sell-off actually continued for another year after that recession happened. So if you look at the market sell-off from peak to trough, you actually had three notable counter trend rallies between 2001 and 2002. The 19% one that we have lifted, we also had a 22% counter trend rally. You also had a 21% counter trend rally. So these are all counter trend rallies that are in the, the ballpark of where we find ourselves today. Below that, you can see that the biggest counter trend rally during the great financial crisis was 24%. 
And maybe if you want to look at the great financial crisis a little bit differently, if you go to the right-hand side, we labeled all of the notable counter-trend rallies that occurred over that year and a half, and there were eight of them. And you can see that there were some really aggressive ones, like the, the last one, which lasted for 31 days and was 24%. But also, there were others that lasted a long period of time. So you can see in the second quarter of 2008, there was a 51-day rally um, that happened over a 12% time frame, a 12% 12 rally over 51 days, which was almost two months. So these can be long, and they can also be very aggressively higher. So whether or not the low has been made, it's unclear. But typically speaking, bottoming is a process. It's very rare to see the markets hit a low and then rebound back up without testing the lows. The only time that we've really seen that was the fourth quarter of 2018, where the day after Christmas happened, markets shot higher and they never looked back. A lot of times you have a retesting of the low two, sometimes even three times. So because of that, we came out with the recovery dashboard a group of nine indicators that have done a really good job of being able to tell whether or not a durable bottom has taken form. Um, and they run across the three fault lines of the economy on the left-hand side. So at the very top, you can see we look at confidence measures. Then below that, we look at economic measures. And then finally, at the bottom, we look at financial measures. And it's the reverse of what we saw with the recession dashboard. Red is a recession, yellow is improvement, and then green is expansion. And the goal here is to get to green and to indicate that the worst has passed and that it's safe to re-risk your portfolios and take a little bit more beta on with your uh, portfolio allocation. Now, there, there are different indicators in here. Three of them are the same. What we saw at the recession dashboard, um, that's initial jobless claims, building permits, and then also credit spreads. Um, two of them are cousins, I like to say, <laughs> with a business confidence um, indicator and then also consumer confidence. And then there's four new indicators altogether. But the key here is that generally speaking, it's going to take a little bit of time for a durable bottom to form. And usually, and this may be the exception, but who knows, we only know in hindsight, you will see a retesting of lows before a final low can take hold. Now here's the recovery dashboard's output. Um, and you know, the proof statement for the recovery dashboard. This looks at the month that it went green and the last seven recoveries. And at the very bottom there, you can see how far away that green signal was from the end of that recession. So for example, if you look at the 07 through 09 period, we went green five months before the recession ended. So we went green in January of 2009. The recession ended in June of 2009. So we we're five months early. In the 2001 scenario, we were actually one month late. We turned green one month after the recession ended. But if you look at these on average, the overall signal has turned yellow five months before a recession ended, and it's green one month before a recession ended. But as we just talked about, the markets have bottomed three months before a recession ends. So looking at it from a market bottom perspective, the yellow has come in on average two months before the S&P 500 trough and green one month after. So we've designed this specifically to be a little bit after the bottom because of the prevalence of those counter trend rallies we want to make sure that you don't whipsaw people um, into getting faked out into those counter trend rallies. And that's a key reason why a lot of people, they're very negative at the end of a recessionary drawdown because they've fallen victim to a lot of those counter trend rallies. They re risk their portfolios only to see that counter trend, rally, counter trend rally fail and the markets move further lower to their ultimate lows. Uh, at the, and who knows, again, who, what that's going to be. Um, but on average, again, we're going to be yellow a little bit before the lows and then green right after the lows. Maybe to give you an idea of how this may play out, this looks at the recovery dashboard um, heading into the great financial crisis and coming out the other side. You can see that uh, there's a very big difference here between a green signal and a yellow signal. A yellow signal is not the all clear to, to re-risk your portfolios and that the worst has passed. Um, I, think, I think it's similar to a stoplight. You know, if you see the yellow signal, it just means increased caution. Um, you've had a couple of periods where the dashboard went yellow and back to red. We're looking at one of them. We went yellow back in early 2008, and we went red about a, two or three months before Lehman actually happened. Um, and you also had a similar situation back in 1974 where we went yellow to red, back to yellow to green. Um, but we've had nine, seven green signals in the dashboard's history. We've had seven durable recoveries, and that's really the signal that we're looking at, what we're looking for here. You can see here we went green at the end of January, uh, which is actually about a month and a half before the ultimate market low. Now, what can we, what are we looking for for a durable bottom here? 
Well, obviously, I think it has to start with monetary policy. And this looks at global central banks, how many of them are cutting. And we're now reaching levels that we last saw back in the financial crisis and back in the 2001 recession. And right now, over 70% of global central banks are cutting rates together. Um, so when everybody's cut, working in tandem with one another, that's how a durable bottom can typically be formed. And again, what the Fed has done is unprecedented. And it's a clear reason why risk assets have moved higher over the last uh, 20, 13 trading days, so two and a half weeks. Um, I think the Fed took its kitchen sink approach where they threw a kitchen sink at the market and they found another kitchen sink and they threw that one too. And what really impressed me and it took me by surprise is what happened on Thursday of last week. The Fed announced another $2.3 trillion worth of stimulus. That came out of nowhere. And it really was supposed to support the areas of the markets that investors felt were being left out or needed a little bit more backstopping. Extended credit to small and medium-sized businesses. It also established the immunity facility, much more backing in, in that arena. And then also it included fallen angels in corporate facilities, companies that were triple B that are now getting downgraded to double B. And you've seen that with Ford here recently, which is the largest fallen angel. Now, this is really important because if you have a lot of fallen angels because of this situation, um, that can cause distortions in fixed income and equity markets. And, and it could cause contagion as investors look to other uh, balance sheets and companies that are questionable that could become the next fallen angel. So this was a very important thing that the Fed has done. Also, they're supporting areas of the leveraged loan market, the AAA tranches of CLOs. And they've also said that they're even going to be buying high yield ETFs. But you know, even though they're buying high yield ETFs, the purchases are likely going to be small. But nonetheless, the Fed has clearly recognized the urgency here. And I think this is a key reason why this will not be the Great Depression 2.0. I think there's going to be an overhang, and this is going to be with us longer than, than consensus, but they have saved us from having a great depressionary outcome because a lot of these businesses that wouldn't be solvent will be solvent on the other side of this storm. The other thing that we were obviously looking for was some uh, support from fiscal stimulus, and it's not just the U.S. that's done fiscal stimulus. Almost every major economy has done some uh, fiscal stimulus here recently. If you look at the CARES Act, for example, um, that was $2.2 trillion. Um, that was close to 10% of U.S. GDP. Um, to put that in perspective, if you look at Ob uh, President Obama's American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, that was 5.7% of GDP. So we're looking at a package that's twice as big. And, and quite frankly, it was the largest single piece of legislation since FDR's New Deal. Um, if you take the Fed's lending capabilities into consideration because of that fiscal package, this amplifies the stimulus up closer to $8 trillion dollars which is close to 40% of US GDP. So one of my concerns with fiscal stimulus was that the money wasn't going to get into the hands of consumers and businesses in an orderly fashion. And the reason why I was skeptic is that if you looked back in the 2001 and 2008 fiscal packages, it took three and a half months, three and a half months from individuals to receive their checks. Three and a half months in this type of environment would have been, it would have been an atrocity. It would have made the damage very much worse, especially for small businesses, because if you look at the average small business, and this is a survey that's funded, done by JP Morgan, they only had 27 days worth of working capital to survive. So the good news is, is that the first checks went out last week to consumers using direct deposits that people use for taxes. Um, and also the Small Business Administration's fiscal plan is finally progressing as the guidance was released to financial institutions. And that, I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be issues and delayed and delays with getting the money to people, but this is gonna be measured in weeks rather than months. So the good news is, is that I think this fiscal stimulus package will work where the others unfortunately did not work to stem the tide of those recessions. Last thing I'll mention here is that there's gonna be a fourth fiscal package coming. It's not a question of when, uh, it's, it's a question of when, not if. Um, it's gonna be focused more on disaster relief, and I think it's probably gonna come sometime in the early May timeframe, but we could be looking at another trillion dollars of stimulus. Um, there's also probably going to be a program to support the small business lending program because expectations suggest that that's going to run out of money in the next week or so. But again, this is a very good sign that this, the authorities are doing what is needed to potentially have a bottom. And then the other thing that you could have for a bottom is that valuations overshoot to the downside. Now, obviously, valuations right now are pretty elevated. Um, if you're looking at the forward PE of the market, it's actually above 16, which is the long-term average. Um, if you do see valuations overshoot to the downside and the markets are down 
40 or 45 percent from the highs, that could be something that could create a technical base. But uh, we're, we're clearly not at that point, uh, given the, the rebound that we've seen in markets here recently. And the last thing that uh, obviously I want to mention here is that volatility spikes tend to be good entry points. This looks at uh, all the volatility spikes that we've seen since 1990. That's when volatility came out. And we define a spike as a month over over month increase of volatility of 50%. If you look at the six months post those volatility spikes, you can see that the average increase of the S&P 500 six months post that spike has been 9% and your hit rate was 89%. So again, when you see these volatility spikes, they tend to be really good buying opportunities. Now, the last couple of slides I just want to share with you here um, before maybe we open up the floor to questions. Um, I think this is a really interesting slide. Um, it, you know, a lot of people think that they can be market timers, um, that uh, being a market timer can help you, uh, your long-term gains. But we assume that you had a person that was a reasonably good market timer, and they were able to consistently buy, sell the market 10 months before the peak, and they were able to consistently buy the market back 10 months after the lows. Um, this goes back to 1936. And you can see that even if you're a buy and hold investor, your cumulative return on $100 would have been close to 22,000 versus this buy and hold uh, individual um, who had a very good benefit of hindsight, their cumulative return was closer to $9,000. So again, uh, we, we've been telling a lot of our retail clients, buy and hold is, is a fool's errand. You never know the top or the bottom is going to be. Buy and hold is the way that you, you really want to invest for the long haul. Uh, but uh, also, we've been trying to advocate to our clients that bear markets are really something that shouldn't be feared. Um, believe it or not, since 1928, the S&P 500 has been 20% below its previous peak, so i.e. in a bear market, 30%, 39% of the time. So almost 40% of the time, the market is in a technical bear market. And we've been fortunate. We haven't seen a bear market uh, for the entirety of this uh, this recovery, really. Um, but even if we do see a pullback down for markets, um, it's nothing to be afraid of. And this is common uh, a common place for the S&P 500 to be in in order to get those long-term returns. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to just go and we're going to talk about eight themes that we have slides for. Um, I want to go into the volatility section, and then maybe I'll turn it back over to Hank for open Q&A. But the areas that we have slides for is the U.S. presidential agenda, the international space currency, and this can be more focused on the dollar, negative rates, debt, and when we talk about that, it's student, um, household, and then U.S. debt, corporate credit, volatility, and then valuations. Um, one, one area I really want to hit on here is volatility. Um, and we've been advocating for higher volatility for, for quite some time to our clients, and this was the key reason why, is that volatility will usually follow the yield curve with a three-year lag. What that really means is, is that with the yield curve flattens today, three years later, you'll have higher volatility. And obviously, with the VIX spike that we've seen here recently, you've seen this line catch up uh, to where it should be in, in, in quite some time. So uh, again, um, with the yield curve flattening, that usually means that you have a weaker economy with a, a little bit of a lag here. But we've been advocating higher volatility is going to be something we're going to have to deal with as investors uh, over the last nine months. Um, but we want to look at which er areas of the equity markets do well during periods of market volatility, i.e., which sectors you want to hide out in when you have a major market drawdown. And this looks at the seven last seven major market drawdowns we've had. There's been that uh, we define that as a drawdown of 15% or greater. And on the left hand side, that was the relative performance of that sector to the market on average during those drawdowns. And you can see stable to outperform the market. Uh, on average by 20%, so that it was by far and away the best, followed by utilities and healthcare at 14 and 12% respectively. And on the right-hand side, that was your hit rate. How many times out of those seven did you outperform? Um, and you can see, again, those same three, staples, utilities, and healthcare, outper outperformed seven out of seven times. So again, if you're fearful of uh, higher market volatility and downward pressure, these are the areas that you want to hide out in. And, and quite frankly, it's the areas that a lot of our portfolio managers have been overweight here um, in the market volatility that we've seen. Now, looking at it from a different uh, perspective, we looked at, again, the last seven major market drawdowns, and we looked at what's the performance of these sectors the year following the end of that drawdown, i.e., which sectors outperform uh, when it's time to re-risk your portfolio. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, you can see on a relative basis, information technology is the best, outperforming on a relative basis by 23%, followed by uh, financials at 15 
And then on the right, nobody had a 100% hit rate, um, but IT outperformed six out of seven of those times. And uh, financials, industrials, and consumer discretionary outperformed five out of seven for a hit rate of 71%. Now, thinking about the environment that we're in today, I think that financials may have a little bit more of a difficult time outperforming. And the reason why is because I, I don't believe that the yield curve is going to um, uh, going to widen out substantially from here. Given the fact that the Fed is doing an aggressive QE program, I mean, the Fed's balance sheet has increased by $1.9 trillion since the end of February. $1.9 trillion is double the amount that we saw with all the QE buying in 2013, which was the biggest QE program that we had in the post-crisis era. So $1.9 trillion is a massive increase on their balance sheet. A lot of that is treasury buying. I don't think that we're going to see the 10-year treasury go up substantially from here. So that's probably going to be a little bit of an overhang to financials. Um, I do think coming out the other side of this storm, it's going to be more of a U-shaped recovery where people are going to be a little bit hesitant to go back to their normal lives. And if that's going to be the case, it's going to be more of a slow growth type of environment, one where uh, information technology or IT uh, can be outperform uh, and, and also consumer discretionary if people are scared to go to retail stores and operate again as they normally had prior to the crisis, um, I think that could be an area that sees some weakness as well. So this uh, this this uh, layout that we've traditionally seen uh, may not play out the way that uh, that it has historically. I think there's going to be pockets of strength and pockets of weakness. One last slide I want to share with you here um, before I, I give you my closing thoughts um, is that the areas that we want to play defense in may not be the areas that uh, have historically been the ones that you've hidden out in. Most people think that you want to hide out in value when the markets sell off. And we've been advocating to our clients that there has been a paradigm shift and that the areas that you want to hide out in when you have market volatility and downward pressure on the markets have really been large cap core and large cap growth. Now, we looked at every 5% plus sell off that we've seen since 2005. There's been 24 of them. Large cap core and large cap growth had the best average performance. And we're looking at this versus the Russell 15, 1500 index. Um, and you can see that the hit rate for large cap core was the best at 83%. And you can see that large cap growth outperformed 75% uh, of those times. Now, the one thing I really wanna highlight here is that the next closest hit rate to those two is small cap growth at 42%. Um, so again, we've been advocating large core, large growth in the areas that you wanna have an overweight to during this downturn. And uh, believe it or not, from peak to trough, um, these, again, have been the areas that have outperformed uh, during this sell-off as well. So this is, again, a trend that continues. So I'll maybe close with my, my thoughts, and we'll turn it over to Hank for open Q&A, um, is that I do believe that the return to normalcy is going to be slower than what market participants currently expect. Um, just because uh, I think that there's going to be a, a little bit of a reluctance for everybody to go back to their normal ways of living. I don't think households are going to spend. I think they're going to increase their savings, similar to what you saw back in the 1930s and then the 2008 recession. I think people are going to be nervous to go back to bars and restaurants, anywhere that has mass gatherings. Um, that's going to create a situation where a lot of these companies that have given a liquidity bridge from the Fed, if you see revenues that are down you know, 25%, 30% from where you were pre-crisis, they may not be able to survive when the stimulus runs out and we're back into 2021. So I think there's going to be a little bit of an overhang there. Fewer people going on vacation, older generations staying home until a vaccine is released. Also, I think there's going to be less business travel, um, lower buybacks, uh, I think is a foregone conclusion as a lot of over leveraged corporations seek to pay down debt rather than buy back their stock. Um, so I, I do think that this is going to be a, a different type of recovery than what we've typically been accustomed to. And if you think about where the markets are right now, they're pricing in a V-shaped recovery with no second wave of infections and then also no material effect to business and consumer behavior. Um, the second wave of infection, quite frankly, is something that makes me very concerned because, again, of that regionalized approach that we did in the U.S., there is a real chance that the interior will reinfect the coasts when they come off of lockdown. Also, you're already starting to see second waves in Japan. Um, you're seeing it in Hong Kong and Singapore as well. Um, also, if we don't close our borders, international travelers that come into the U.S. could spark a second wave. And you, if you look over in Mexico and Brazil, for example, they've been very lax on their reactions to the virus. Now, if you look at China, and this is really where the markets have been watching, 
China has imposed very strict border controls in their country. They are not letting any foreigners in. And if you're a Chinese national that comes into China, you have to undergo a 14-day quarantine before being allowed to enter. And to illustrate this point, if you look at the number of airline flights into China last week, it was 108 international flights. This last week, and you know, this last week a year before, it was 18,000 flights. Um, also, which is really concerning to me is that you've seen an extremely slow bottoming process for the Chinese consumer, despite a stronger pickup in production. Even after the restrictions have been lifted, demand for anything that requires a face-to-face -face transaction or a large crowd remains extremely weak. So if you think about this from the U.S. point of view, the U.S. consumer spending is about 15 percent more of our GDP than what you have over in China. And I think it, there's a complacent view that everybody will go back to normalcy. And I think the only way that we do that is if we have some sort of vi a, a, a vaccine or a cure for the coronavirus, which we don't have at this point. And then the last thing I'll say here before, again, I turn it over to Hank, is that historically, recessions are jump-started by a shock. The shock this time was the COVID-19 shutdowns, but those shocks in the past have been a sharp rise of interest rates, oil price spikes, geopolitical events, maybe a credit or liquidity event. But importantly, even when these shocks fade, and they can fade very quickly a lot of the times, economic weakness in the economy tends to persist and create a negative feedback loop. You have weak final demand, it leads to poor profits, and weakness in the labor and credit markets. And I know this is thought of as a different crisis because policymakers have ag reacted aggressively. I think that this same dynamic is going to play out again. And if, you know, if, if, if policymakers didn't act as aggressively as they did, this would no doubt be the Great Depression 2.0. So I think what policymakers have done is, is uh, you know, a, is exactly the, the, the prescription of what we've needed. Uh, it's certainly going to help that 20% unemployment rate go back to maybe 10% or 9%, but there are going to be businesses that just won't be back to 100%. There are going to be businesses that fail because of the change of behavior. Um, so I think that, uh, again, the markets have rebounded very dramatically here, um, but I do think that there's going to be some choppiness in the future. And when we start to get back into some normalcy of a uh, an economy, I believe these changes and will ultimately find themselves into some negative market price action as the markets price down ultimately what companies are going to be able to earn and what the true effect of this virus is, is going to do to the economy. So uh, with that, Hank, I'll maybe I'll turn it over to you for some Q&A. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that great uh, presentation. So as Jeff mentioned, and as I mentioned in the beginning, if you have questions, please submit it by using the GoToWebinar portal and type in your questions. Jeff, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so just uh, jumping off from your last point about, you know, this may be a little bit longer, it's more of a U curve than a V curve recovery. Um, to what degree in your expectations did you factor in, you know, what you mentioned, you know, medical treatment and or vaccine uh, to essentially bring the U.S. economy back to normalcy or in society writ large? Yeah, so, you know, I, I'm... I'm you know, knock on wood. I hope that we can get a vaccine or a cure here in a reasonable time frame. But unfortunately, you know, given the length of time it takes for human trials and things like that, it's you know, I've I've talked to our healthcare experts at Clearbridge, and their most optimistic timeline is is 12 to 18 months. Um, so this, that doesn't mean that there can't be therapies that can make the death rate much lower. Uh, there's been some that have been uh, advertised out there. Um, from a number of different regions, um, but I, I think to have a true vaccine or a cure, we're, we're looking at a year at the at the earliest. So until you have that, I think consumer behavior is going to be altered and uh, it's going to have an effect on the economy. And we may go back to maybe an 85% economy uh, versus where we were pre-virus. Pre and an 85% economy is a, a pretty nasty recession. I mean, we're on par with, you know, economic activity dropping uh, similar to what you saw in the Great Depression at an 85% economy. But that's one of the, the the things that I'm hoping for, the silver lining that as the world works together and all the money that's been thrown at trying to find a cure, um, and it overwhelms the market, that we can get something in production that can be a vaccine or a cure sooner than later. But uh, I think realistically, I think that's probably at least 12 months out from now. Jeff, in terms of sort of the major market indexes, um, you know, uh, S&P 500, you know, Russell, 
et cetera. Do you anticipate uh, any one of them being in the positive territory at the end of 2020 or in the negative territory? Well, I, 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 all right, I'll caveat my, my thoughts and my outlook with, if, you, if we do have a cure or a vaccine that comes out uh, somewhat earlier than anticipated, the markets absolutely uh, could be in positive territory this year. Um, but I, I think, uh, again, given the overhang um, and the stigma that's going to happen and the fact that there are likely going to be second waves of infections, and I mean, and you see this with the Spanish flu, there were three waves of the Spanish flu at the end of the day. Um, I, I think that uh, there's going to be very challenging for indices to claw back all of their losses and end the year positive um, outside of a, a cure. I would say the U.S. would probably be the area that I'd look to to have the most likelihood of, of that happening. And the reason why I say that is because the U.S. has done the most from a fiscal and monetary perspective. Um, looking back to the 08 recession, um, the first market to bottom believe it or not, was China, because China had done a massive stimulus package in October of 2008 of 10% uh, of GDP. Um, that caused their economy to bottom. Um, the next area that bottomed was commodities uh, in late 2008, obviously, because if China was going to do a lot of infrastructure spending, a lot of housing spending that was going to be a positive boost to commodities. And ultimately, the U.S. was you know, one of the later ones to bottom in March uh, of 09. Um, similar to, to that kind of framework, given the shock and awe of the stimulus that we've seen here in the U.S. that would bode well for our economy to be potentially the one that's going to bottom first and or uh, be in positive territory by year end. But I, I, again, I, I, I think that there's more to play out on that front, just to, given the change that I expect in consumer behavior and the likely solvency issues that uh, a lot of companies are going to have because of that. Great, thank you. Um, what is your recommendation for institutional clients like public sector pension plans? Um, obviously, our time frame and investment strategy is different than retail um, investors. Uh, do you have anything specific for public plans? I mean, look, I, I think obviously, given the longer time horizon that that, that you have, I, I think. Um, Legging into equities and keeping maintaining your exposure to equities is a is a great risk reward right now. I mean, I've given human ingenuity. I wouldn't be surprised if we do have a cure in a year and a half or two years, um, and this sets up pretty nicely for the the equities to to do well coming out the other side of this. But given my view that I, I do think that the markets had this counter trend rally that we're experiencing right now, and we're likely going to see markets move lower um, at some point in time. And I think it may be a month before we start to move lower. We may be in a trading range until the economy starts to come back online. I do think it makes sense to look at the style box here and, and really focus on large core, large cap growth um, as areas that, that play defense until a, a clear bottom has emerged. And again, I, I just say that the bottom could have already happened, but I do see that the most optimistic scenario is priced into U.S. equities at this given moment. Um, so I, I think also if you think about it from an international perspective, historically international markets have outperformed at the end of a global recession. Valuations are much less robust in the international markets as well. Um, but I do think that this is going to hurt a lot of the international markets, especially in the emerging markets, because companies are going to reevaluate whether or not they want to have their supply chains going through emerging markets anymore. I mean, if you looked at the stimulus package that was thrown out by the Japanese government last week, um, and they threw out a massive stimulus package, it was 20% of GDP, which actually puts our stimulus package to shame. They earmarked $2 billion worth of subsidies for Japanese companies to help them relocate their factories from China back home to Japan. And the government's gonna subsidize two thirds of those costs if you're a small or medium sized business. I think that's going to happen not only in Japan, but also I think every com company is, is thinking about their supply chain and making it either more diverse or also localizing it as well. And I think because of that, um, you're going to see a lot more onshoring um, uh, and it's going to hurt a lot of these areas that have been a beneficiary of, of globalization. Um, if you're looking at that in the, in the reverse, they, they're going to be hurt as you see this transition. The good news is, this transition is going to happen over the, the course of a number of years, so, but it will be an overhang um, for areas, especially like emerging markets, for example, that have benefited from that. Um, and also thinking about it from a, a just a general market perspective, if you're an international 
a multinational company and you do have complex supply chains and you do need to reorient those, um, when you do, that's going to ultimately be costly and, and probably hurt your margins uh, and ultimately where your share price can be. So that's one other area of consideration that you need to, to have when, when investing. Jeff, I think this is more of a comment, uh, but I'd like your reaction. So the commenter likes uh, your uh, your observation that you know public pensions should invest for the long term and not be put off by bear markets. But it seems that the rebound doesn't reflect the potential for a severe prolonged recession. Yeah, I, I, I've been uh, I've, I've been talking to our investment team just yesterday, and I, and I think. The markets uh, have clearly priced in the most optimistic scenario. Um, V-shaped recovery, no second wave, no material effects to the consumer or businesses. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we've been advocating to remain cautious, know what you own, have a high quality type of portfolio. Um, you know, we, we've been advocating dividend growing types of companies. Those tend to be much more defensive oriented, have moats around their businesses, want to be focusing on areas of the uh, sectors and areas of the market that again have those defensive attributes that we went through um but uh, you know again um, i don't think it's obviously a reason why you want to reduce your equity exposure dramatically um, but i think you need to be uh, very um, explicit with which managers are in your matrix and you you really want to focus on those managers that that have that safety uh bend to them that defensive bend to them at, at this given point just because i don't think that this is over um even though the market's certainly do with the uh, the rebound that we've seen. I think this is going to be drawing on for, for a lot longer than, you know, the month and a half that it's taken this to, to play out. Jeff, final question. Uh, assuming, you know, the, the conventional wisdom that a virus will take 12 to 18 months, what would, what fiscal and monetary policies would you like to see, be, you know, for 2020 and 2021 what are the benefits of those and what are the potential negative consequences uh, beyond 2021? Yeah, that, that's a that's a really good question. So from the Fed's perspective, they've done everything that they could have done at this point. I mean, outside of doing yield curve control and buying high yield paper, the Fed has backstopped financial markets, right? So I, I think uh, the Fed has done their job and I, I don't think that anything is more needed more on the Fed side, at least not at this point. But one thing that I'm concerned about is that if you look at the fiscal package, you're adding $600 per week to people that get unemployment benefits. And an analysis has, was done and, uh, you know, with, that suggests that anyone that makes under $50,000, you're better off being on un unemployment because of that big boost and being back in your working job. And it's, right now the unemployment benefits are being juiced up to the end of July. If you see another fiscal package come and that extends unemployment benefits to say, I don't know, uh, you know, October, November, December, um, that really does disincentivize individuals from going back and transitioning back into the labor market. And it may actually create a, a situation where you have a, a much larger overhang um, of the jobless rates, uh, because financially speaking, it's better to, to stay on unemployment than, than go back into work. So, um, I, you know, again, you obviously want to support those people that have fallen into a tough time and they're in a jobless situation. But um, I, I would be, I would actually view it as a negative if you do see a, a CARES 2.0 package that extends those benefits out for a, a prolonged period of time. Um, also, what I also I think is very very important here is because I do believe that there's a change in consumer behavior. I would like to see the small business lending program extended uh, further than, than eight weeks at this given moment. I, I think it's probably going to be something that needs to be extended, call it 16 weeks, 20 weeks. I'm not sure what the right time frame is. It's really going to know that once the economy comes back online. But keeping small businesses afloat um, creates a situation where these people that are on unemployment can transition back into a job. And rather than having to work off an unemployment rate that's in the, the teens, and it's going to take years and years to be able to work that off. So those are the two areas from a fiscal perspective that I'm, I'm really looking at. But from a Fed perspective, I think they've done exactly what they needed to do in order to, to stem the, the bleeding here. Jeff, thank you very much for your time and this great presentation. Uh, thank you all for tuning in today. At the conclusion of this webinar, there are three short uh, survey questions that we ask you to answer. 
thank you again for joining us today and we look forward to hosting you at the next webinar which is going to be next tuesday uh, april 21st uh, with ice miller and williams and jensen's to talk about in detail the various uh, fiscal packages that have been passed in washington dc and their impact on public plans thank you very much jeff thank you everyone thanks for having me